nice to see you all here. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, today's presentation. Uh, <clears throat> we circulate around a book, for those of you who haven't been to any of these sessions, I'd appreciate it if you would just sign as it says, because uh, we keep sort of track to get some idea of what institutes people come from and so forth who attend these sessions. Uh, uh, for those who have more or less regularly attended, I want to remind you that uh, next Tuesday is uh, the last session of the course. It uh, is on the metabolic basis of aging, and uh, it was postponed from a snowstorm uh, during uh, uh, during uh, the winter. So it's been posted, circulated, and we'll have things on, on the website, uh, background of speakers and topic and, and so forth. So uh, today's uh, speaker is <coughs> Tom uh, Kermigas, uh, whom I read about in uh, Science uh, Magazine, uh, acknowledging his receipt uh, from the Smithsonian uh, Institution of their highest award for lifetime uh, achievement in uh, astrophysics in particular. Uh, he was born in the island of Chios in Greece. Uh, at some point in his early career, was excited by the occurrence of Sputnik, uh, which then influenced uh, much of his uh, uh, later, later life. Uh, he came to the United States where he studied physics at the University of Minnesota and then went to the University of Iowa where he received his PhD. And that was particularly significant because he was a student of James Van Allen, uh, for whom the Van Allen belt is named. And so uh, Tom was very much interested, involved, and excited by the prospect. So his career parallels really the dawn of planetary uh, exploration. And he has been a major player in it. Uh, he's the only person on Earth who has been to every planet in the solar system, at least instrumentally speaking, uh, and continues in uh, his research interests, advisory capacities, and so forth. Uh, he is the emeritus head of the Space Department and the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's received all kinds of awards and citations and so forth. Uh, and his main contribution has been to encourage the use of robotic exploration and development of unique techniques, uh, far less expensive than manned exploration and incredibly effective. Probably the most dramatic one in recent times uh, was the uh, uh, flyby on the planet Pluto that took place, I think, just about a year ago. Well, I asked Tom to discuss with us, excite us, which we don't need, I think, to be knowing about planetary exploration, but to share with us some of his experiences, and in particular, his comments, thoughts, and experience with the idea of, are we in a, a dawn of the potential of uh, human space flight. Uh, I think many physicists uh, feel that the major contribution of the original uh, NASA operations in space was the development of miniaturization. And the miniaturization, the chip, the techniques, and others of course, spills over and dramatically has changed everything that uh, we do here at the NIH and people do all over the place. And so one of the intriguing questions, I suppose, is if one contemplates human spaceflight, 
what kind of technologies and discoveries have to be made before anything like that is remotely possible. And potentially that offers very exciting opportunities for people who are trained today in biomedical research, biophysics, whatever it is. For those of also last comment, <laughs> is there anybody here who doesn't know what this picture is? You don't know. Okay, why don't you tell them? Do you know what it is? Okay, Pat, what is it? It's the Brooklyn Bridge. So we show the Brooklyn Bridge as the logo of this uh, course because we are like those two gentlemen on the catwalk connecting uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn. Life is never the same when a bridge has been built on either side. So today we're gonna to hear about bridge building, not on planet Earth, but on planets. So thank you very, very much for being with us, Tom, and we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arias, for a kind introduction. I'm very pleased and, and somewhat intrigued to be here because I uh, don't believe I can tell you uh, a lot about medicine, <laughs> or certainly uh, I will not be doing any demystifying. Uh, however, I do hope that uh, I will shed uh, some light on uh, uh, and, and bring some uh, perspective into the, uh, the science of doing robotic exploration and what we know now that we didn't know 60 years ago. And then uh, uh, the last part of my talk, I hope to address uh, those issues that Dr. Arias uh, mentioned about uh, human uh, spaceflight exploration and how possible is that and how soon can we expect to see it and and also how many things are there that we don't know that uh, generally revolve not so much on the technology that we have at the present time uh, although there is a lot to be done there but mainly about how human species would uh, actually uh, function in, uh, in a space environment and for how long. And that's an area where I think all the young faces that I see in the audience, uh, I hope will be making big contributions too, because there are a lot of them to be, to be made before a human exploration uh, at any scale begin, becomes possible. So the pictures that you see on this cover slide are essentially images of the planets obtained by spacecraft that have actually visited each one of these. And for some of these, we have actually uh, stayed there as satellites of these planets. And, uh, and as you all know, this uh, activity began uh, some uh, 60 years ago when uh, Sputnik was launched. Uh, I, I, uh, I uh, did speak about that. And I was a freshman at the time at the University of Minnesota. And there was this fear that was going over the United States in the the height of the Cold War, and was sending out the signal, and nobody could do anything about it. And, and the country was in, in panic about the Soviets having hurled a spear that we couldn't shoot down, uh, and uh, what's going on in this country. And to some extent, that was a good thing because that actually spurred the uh, technological revolution, if you like, and, and educational revolution in the math, in math and, and sciences in general. And the man who was in the middle of that was my physics advisor, uh, James Van Allen. Uh, he built the first US 
satellite Explorer 1 that was launched uh, four months after Sputnik. He was at the University of Iowa, but before that time, he had been a, a member of the staff at the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins. Uh, things are uh, how, how things can evolve like that. Anyway, uh, he discovered these rings of radiation which are shown schematically around the Earth that uh, at fairly very high altitudes and uh, they're called, uh, they were dubbed by the press Van Allen belts. Uh, he never called them that. Uh, the press uh, dubbed them when the announcement was made. As you can see, he was a, a famous man on the cover of Time magazine and that was a big deal. So uh, that was the beginning, and, and he is considered the father of American space science. Uh, so I'm sure you have seen this uh, video that uh, was actually uh, came out after the fall of the Soviet Union, and it shows the Gagarin flight, the first human flight in space on 12 April 1961. And, uh, and of course, he became a hero for not only the Soviet Union and the world. And then the next thing, of course, was the flight of Alan Shepard, which was a suborbital flight, mind you, went to uh, about 150 kilometers and came back. Uh, these are the original seven astronauts that were picked by NASA. And uh, by comparison, it was not as big an accomplishment. Uh, you can see Shepard's face almost to notice how anxious he was when you look at his eyes. Uh, and it was only uh, a month after the Gagarin flight. And Gagarin had gone around the uh, Earth, and, and the best we could do was to have that uh, suborbital flight, but it was. Uh, intense competition at the time, uh, and you can see here the he, how he came out of the capsule, uh, fell in, in the sea, and onto the uh, aircraft carrier. And then the launch control, T minus the, the thing that was uh, really the big thing, the race with as the uh, former Soviet Union, who was going to get to the moon first. From their crew quarters. And this is Apollo uh, 11, and you can tell. U.S. astronauts, Bill Armstrong, and Collins, of course, Aubrey, and, 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 and Collins, who uh, really did go out to the moon. Uh, I know there are some conspiracy theories that said the U.S. never did go to the moon, and it was all to the Hollywood studio. Well, that's certainly not true. Uh, as if it's possible to keep a secret in this country. Uh, so, uh, that was a big day in uh, July. Four forward, drift into the right level. 30, 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, 30 seconds. it turned out Contact that uh, the navigation was okay, not, all that, not all that close. Okay, quality base uh, here. The Eagle has the, landed. Uh, lander was within 11 seconds of running out of fuel. And we can land it just there. One we have crashed. And Neil Armstrong to credit uh, the tool and said the things that he did. Okay. Buzz is erecting the solar wind experiment now. Uh, so the the next thing was the solar wind experiment. That's what they were talking about. Uh, I have talked to Buzz Aldrin about this. This was a set of instruments that were left on the moon and they worked very well. But I'm going to get back to the human aspect later on, what I would like to proceed with now is tell you how do we get to go to the planets with robotic spacecraft. Uh, this is just a, a little schematic that I picked out of uh, uh, National Geographic. Uh, I don't know if we could lower the front lights, perhaps you could see better if that's possible, but uh, if that's not possible, you will. And, and what it shows is that the Earth is here obviously speeded, speeded up day and night. <laughs> and the sun is at the center. Great, that, that, that might do it. And uh, you can see 
the, uh, the inner planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then you see the asteroid belt. That's where thousands of asteroids reside. Then you see Jupiter and Saturn with the ring and Uranus and Neptune. And Pluto is not shown in this, in this diagram. But uh, you see, and, and it's fairly accurate, you can see all the moons of, uh, I shouldn't say all the moons, but the major moons of some of the planets are rotating. So there's a lot of exploring to be done uh, in looking at the planets. And it was done with a very well thought out uh, policy statement, if you like, by the National Academy of Sciences. It was to advance scientific knowledge and to look for the potential of life elsewhere. And then there are specific questions. Did the planets, uh, how did they originate? Did the solar system, how did the solar system evolve? Did life begin and evolve on Earth or has it evolved elsewhere in the solar system? And what are the characteristics that led to the origin of life? And needless to say, I'm not sure we know any specific and deterministic answers to any of these questions, but those are the aim of planetary, the aims of planetary exploration. Uh, these are the planets as uh, uh, imaged by spacecraft. And on top here, you see everything in uh, scale, in the same scale, you see the uh, inner planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto is somewhere out here. And you can see, of course, the difference in size. The Earth could just fit into the red spot of Jupiter uh, a couple of times. But down here, what you see is the actual distances in scale. Here's the Sun, here's the inner planets, you know, we're all, our neighbors are all here. And then you get to Jupiter, to Saturn, to Uranus, to Neptune, to Pluto, and I will be telling you about Voyager later on, uh, actually. Uh, but these are the spacecraft that, uh, the very recent spacecraft, this was Messenger to, that orbited Mercury. We have Curiosity on Mars as we speak. We have Cassini-Huygens in orbit around Saturn still. We have the New Horizons that uh, Dr. Arias uh, talked about. And then we have Voyager 1 and 2 that were launched in 1977. And on this scale, Voyager is somewhere out here. I'll show you that later on. So uh, what about the inner planets? Uh, perhaps we can even feel the lights on this side. <coughs> Uh, here are our neighbors, and you look at them, and you say, geez, you know, how come we ended up in, they ended up in such different states? We have the Earth here, 150 million kilometers away. They all have about the same density, because there are a lot of rocks. <coughs> Excuse me, because I'm... Um, getting over a cold and I, uh, my voice is not the best. And the thing that I have uh, highlighted here is the temperatures. On Mercury, we go from minus 193 on the night side to 427. There's no atmosphere to speak of. All. On Venus, not that far away, 462, day and night, but a very thick atmosphere, 92 times as thick as that of Earth. And of course, we know our Earth, and then on Mars, we have minus 87 on the night side to minus 5, so it's below zero all the time, basically, even at its equator. So you start out with the same material as indicated by the densities and what have you. And then you end up in totally different states. The habitable zone is here, where water is both liquid and solid 
and gas, the so-called triple point, and I'm sure all of you who took chemistry and physics in school know about that. The other significant thing that I'll come back to is that the magnetic field, and you might say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Now I'll talk to you about that. 0.3 Gauss for Earth, a very small amount for Mercury, nothing at Venus, and very tiny localized field in the case of, uh, of uh, Mars. So, uh, first mission to Mars, Mariner 4. It was launched um, in 1964. Uh, this was my first instrument as a graduate student of Professor Van Allen. Uh, and, and, and this is the scientific uh, complement of instruments. I have highlighted the imaging system because it was the first digital imager, ladies and gentlemen, that was ever invented. And it was flown on this spacecraft. It wasn't like we have today, it was a VD car, but nevertheless, it was the first digital imager. And uh, typically, a minimum energy trajectory takes about 200 days, 228 days. So we finally got there in, uh, in 1965, on July 15, actually. And show you this picture which shows a bunch of people looking at something. And I'm sure you all think, oh, it's a screen that shows the data coming back. Well, I got news for you. Uh, uh, this is Van Allen, by the way, and that's your Rudy, where I got some hair. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at is a strip chart recorder. You know what the strip chart recorder is? Where the the chart moves slowly, and there's a pen that goes up and down. The bit rate from Mars was eight and a third bits per second. And uh, of course, you're, you know about your cell phone. It's uh, a few million times that. Uh, it took us. Uh, it took uh, about. 23 days to play back all the data. We didn't have a tape recorder on board. And, uh, and of course, uh, the objective for at least my, my part of the instrument and Professor Van Allen was to see whether there were Van Allen belts or Mars. Why not? You know, it rotates like the Earth does. And unfortunately, you know, it's, uh, there are no Van Allen belts <laughs> on Mars. It was a disappointment. But the pictures from Mars, these are some of those that came back, look like you, look, you were looking at the moon. And uh, some of you who, all of you who are young don't know, but a uh, uh, long time ago, there was this idea that there are canals on Mars, and there's intelligent life, and all kinds of stuff like that. And everybody was disabused of all this. But I do want to tell you some of the more modern information. Of course, this curiosity on Mars uh, from 2012. And, and you look at the soil, and you look at the mountains, and you say, ah, oh, this must be a view from Sahara or someplace like that. And, and, and so what's the big deal? Well, it's very different, as, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, last year, you probably saw in the papers about these uh, recurring linear, this is a Latin word, on the slopes of, of, of hell crater. See this dark stuff that is coming down, and here as well. And if you want to look it up, it was published in Nature Geoscience. And everybody was wondering about what these were. And the prevailing ideas were that that these actually were streaks from dust that were blown by the wind uh, down the hill. Uh, however, uh, the instrument, the instrumentation on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and by the way, this is another place, on Violet's Marinaris, and you can see the same kind of streaks 
And the strange thing was that these were coming out seasonally at times when there was spring and summer on Mars. And you would think, aha, something is flowing on the surface of Mars. But how could it if the temperature is always below zero? We were fortunate that we had an instrument on this uh, spacecraft, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was uh, a hyperspectral imager. Hyperspectral meaning that it had about 544 wavelengths. And the purpose for that was so you could do the mineralogy of the planet. And if you want to take a, a picture in a couple of these channels that were focused, let's say, on lines that were reflecting well of, on iron, then you would get the distribution of iron on the surface. What my colleagues did is that, that they identified uh, the presence of salts within these linear, the, the flows. What do the, the salts do? Well, the salts decrease the freezing temperature of water. And we all know that because when snow falls, we throw salts on the road so that we can we can melt all the ice. And it turned out then that you actually have salty liquid water that flows seasonally at temperatures as low as minus 23 degrees. So there are there is liquid water in underground reservoirs that actually comes up seasonally and it goes down the slopes. And because it's salty, it actually can't do that. It doesn't freeze right away. So, uh, but if we go to a little higher altitude, I, I want to share this uh, other result with you. Uh, you see this, uh, what I wrote here is the solar wind temperature. How, how many of you have ever heard of the solar wind? Do you know? So you do. Some of you do. No. Solar wind is a plasma wind that blows away from the sun about a, a million miles an hour, and it expands into space past Earth and past a lot of the other planets. And the temperature is important, it's a million degrees. What does that mean? Well, in the case of Earth, we have a very strong magnetic field. And what it does, because this is a Charles particle wind plasma, it deflects all these particles from coming even close to the atmosphere. And it just goes harmlessly by the Earth. Mars, for some reason, has lost its magnetic field. And what happens is that it impinges on the atmosphere. And we have known this for a while, but there was a paper last year about from the MAVEN spacecraft and I want to show you a little video that they put together. And, and it shows the measurements that they have made of the process of the solar wind coming in from the sun and being, yes, being deflected somewhat. But what you see here is oxygen ions that are picked up from the very thin atmosphere of Mars and blown out into space. So you might say, what good does it do to have a magnetic field? Well, that's what it does. Because if the Earth had lost its magnetic field, we wouldn't have had an atmosphere. I don't know about you, but I don't think some of us would have been around. So it makes a big difference in the way that, that the planets work to have a magnetic field. Now, I don't know why. Okay, I want to show you, however, I, we can't spend any very much time on any one planet. But we can fill a, 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 an hour because uh, on, it, on each one. This is our sister planet. This is an image from Mariner 5. It was my second experiment as a graduate student. Go to Venus. Uh, and uh, you look down and you see a cloud cover, period. There is nothing you can see 
in optical wavelengths on the surface of Venus. Uh, and if you recall from that table I showed you, it uh, has 92 atmospheres, the pressure and the temperature, 462 degrees. Uh, however, uh, you also have heard of the greenhouse effect, which is that this solar radiation comes to the ground if we have CO2 or methane or other greenhouse gases, it gets trapped. And what happens is that the surface gets heated up a lot. So the temperature goes up and up. The atmosphere of Venus is entirely, essentially entirely CO2. So those of you who don't believe in global warming and uh, what CO2 might do to us eventually, and how soon, the only issue is how soon it's going to do it and whether we're going to take any countermeasures. You might say, well, didn't people know about the greenhouse effect? Yeah, we, we all learned about that in school. But, but this time, with Mariner 5, was the first demonstration that people had about what it does to a planet. Uh, it is possible using radar beams to actually scan and image the surface of a planet which you can't see with your eyes. And that's what happened with the Mozilla spacecraft. And uh, this is the global surface of Venus. Uh, this is a, uh, again, it's called synthetic aperture radar. And you can see that there are mountains, there are lava flows. It's a very hot place. And uh, finally, I want to tell you about Mercury, which we got to uh, send a spacecraft to and orbit Mercury uh, since uh, now nine, uh, 2011. Uh, this is the spacecraft on a vibration table at our laboratory in 2003. Uh, and you can see the uh, technicians who were, were pulling things together. And uh, so to get to Mercury, that is very close to the sun, it's only a third of the way from the sun. It's not an easy thing to do. And what this video shows is that we launched the spacecraft and then we kept going by Venus. Because Venus 1 here and pretty soon we say Venus 2. The reason is, that to use the gravity of Venus to slow down the spacecraft. And by doing so, you let the spacecraft slowly fall in the direction of the sun, in this case, in the direction of Mercury. And eventually, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to explain something. Oops, wow, disaster. <laughs> sorry. We'll go back. Uh, so, so we went around the sun 15 times by the time we slowed down the spacecraft enough to really get to the orbit of Mercury. This is Mercury here. And, and fire a rocket motor to capture the spacecraft into orbit. And I want to show you the exact uh, simulation of what happened in March of 2011. And by the way, you notice that we have a heat shield on the direction of the sun, and the spacecraft always knows where the sun is, because if it made a mistake and it exposed the spacecraft, which is built behind the heat shield to the sun, the, uh, it would be the end of the show in about 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, it was very successful uh, with spacecraft. Uh, we, we got terrific uh, measurements over uh, four years, actually. I will uh, just summarize what, uh, what we learned. This is uh, the geologic map of Mercury. Nobody ever knew about this. 
and what you see is uh, enhanced colors of the mineralogy of the planet. Uh, you, you see that uh, this terrific uh, uh, crater, if you like, it's a basin, it's 1,550 kilometers in diameter. It was from the heavy bombardment of the solar system early in, uh, in the life of our solar system. And because the spacecraft and Mercury, of course, is very, that close to the sun, it doesn't have a very regular orbit and it keeps pulling down, going towards the surface. And we used whatever gas we had on board the spacecraft to keep boosting up the orbit. Finally, we ran out of gas. And on April 30th, after four years in orbit, we uh, uh, calculated that the spacecraft would actually hit the surface of Mercury at about this point. The uh, impact speed would be about 8,700 miles per hour. And it should have made the crater of about 17 kilometers. However, it all happened when Mercury, when the spacecraft was on the other side of Mercury, we couldn't see the event happening at Earth, but, uh, but we had calculated it. And this is that day at our control center. And you might say, how come you're applauding the destruction of the spacecraft? It's because we were waiting to see if it's going to come out the other side. If it did, that means that we made a big mistake in our calculation. So it was a very successful program. So now that's all what we know about our inner solar system. We want to go now to, to the outer solar system, the big planets. And uh, you see here a trajectory diagram that shows the trajectories of Voyager 1, is the green line, Voyager 2, they were both launched in 1977. In another year, will be 40 years in space. And we went by Jupiter and by Saturn and Voyager 2 by Uranus and, and Neptune. And in 12 years, we, we actually looked at all, all four outer planets. And uh, this program was initially called, it, oh, and by the way, a very important point I, I should have pointed out, that, that the way this is done is that we go from Earth, this is the, the speed of the spacecraft, and, and you launch it, and the solar gravity pulls it down, pulls down in speed. We go to Jupiter, and we boost it by about 13 kilometers per second. And it still goes down again because of solar gravity. We go to Saturn and we boost it another 15 kilometers per second, and then to Uranus and so on. But if you exceed, ha, huh, forgot, I gave a talk in, in Greek and I, uh, I left here. This is the escape velocity from the solar system. <laughs> uh, and uh, so the Voyagers now are free of the solar system. But this possibility where you can go to one planet and use its gravity, its uh, gravity well, to boost and accelerate the spacecraft to another planet and then another planet happens once every 175 years. You've got to have the planets in the right part of the sky to do that. And when the program was first conceived uh, when I was young, uh, it was uh, presented to uh, as the Outer Planets Grand Tour, a very great name. And uh, Mr. Nixon said, uh-oh, it's too expensive. It was a billion and a half in 1970. You can imagine how much money it would have been. So he said, uh, forget it, we, we're not doing it. So the whole thing went back to the uh, drawing board and uh, we decided to do a program, just go to Jupiter and Saturn. You could do that in four years with this spacecraft. So, uh, and I'll tell you the story uh, that the President Science Advisor told me. They went in to see Mr. Nixon with the uh, NASA Administrator, Mr. Fletcher at the time. 
And they say, well, Mr. President, we have another proposal. But uh, I says, remember that the last time the planets were lined up like that, Mr. Jefferson was sitting at that desk. And he blew it. <laughs> so Nixon laughed and said, oh, all right, do two, which is what we want to do. So we got away with uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And of course, we all knew that the uh, launch was not until 1977. Mr. Nixon was going to not be president anymore. And of course, he ended up leaving earlier than he thought even. Uh, so, so we made sure that as we designed the mission and the spacecraft and put enough fuel on board, that it would have the capability, if a spacecraft survived beyond Saturn, to continue on its trajectory and visit the other planets. And so that's how it will happen. Uh, that's the spacecraft uh, as it sits in the, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's, this is uh, the instrument that my team and I put together, it has an unpronounceable acronym. The specifications are that 825 kilograms, 465 watts, these are plutonium 238 power supply. Now it's only 264. This is the, the antenna, it's always pointing at Earth, and it uses up, it's 3.7 meters, and, it, and the, the transmitter is about 22 watts. This is not a whole lot of power, it's kind of like uh, night light. And the, uh, right now, we still have 22 kilograms of fuel on board that keeps the antenna pointing in the direction of Earth to within 10 seconds of arc. So that's, uh, that's Voyager. The new view of the solar system, with one exception, as of June of 2015, and that was Pluto, that nobody knew anything about. Uh, I won't spend very much time on any of the planets. This is the great Earth spot. The Galilean moons that Galileo Galilei identified when he first made the telescope and looked at them. Uh, the volcanoes of Io was one big surprise when the spacecraft went by, and uh, and after the fact, a graduate student noted that there was this big stuff that was coming off a limb, and uh, he said, "Oh, look at that!" and uh, and then she shouted, and all of us who were at the Porsche laboratory ran into the room to see what the hell he was shouting about. They said, oh, God, the volcano. <laughs> it turns out that there are like 13 active volcanoes on this moon at all times. Uh, the strongest one is 10 times stronger than any Earth volcano. And the altitude is about 300 kilometers. We, of course, have imaged it since with Galileo. And this is the plume when you go right above it and you look down and you can see the material sort of essentially shooting up and falling down into an area of the, south, uh, of the size of, of France. There are hot lava lakes from one of these. Uh, and uh, the, what the temperature here, which the, uh, for you could measure, is 1,100 degrees centigrade which is molten sulfur. So uh, there are many things about many of the other moons. This is Uranus and one of its moons, Miranda. It's on its side. The Miranda is just uh, an amazing object uh, with a diameter and a structure that nobody can understand. And uh, <clears throat> the Voyager discovered 10 new, new moons plus um, uh, uh, actually additional rings. This is Neptune. Uh, you don't see the whole thing, but it has a, a blue spot, like the, the red spot. Uh, they discovered six new moons. 
then it has a moon called Triton, and it has geyser-like eruptions, and it's in a retrograde orbit. So uh, every, every one of these planets was a big surprise. I skipped Saturn on purpose because we now have a spacecraft called Cassini that is in orbit uh, around Saturn, uh, and, and Saturn has all kinds of moons, and Cassini has been in orbit now for about 10 years, and it keeps on discovering moons. Uh, I think the number now is 62 moons. Uh, I will say a couple of things about this moon here called Enceladus, and this other moon called Titan, because it has an atmosphere that's about 50% thicker than that of Earth. And because these are two remarkable objects. That's the spacecraft, by the way. This one is six tons. Voyager was less than one. And uh, I, I saw this to show you. Uh, these are the instruments that my team and I put together. And this is how many people it takes to build an instrument over a number of years. It's not uh, a one-person operation, not by a long shot. It takes a team. You know, I don't know whose slogan that is, but it does <laughs> in this business. So uh, let's see. Can we hear the sound? Uh, this is an image. The spacecraft is back here, the sun is in front, and when you take that image in back scattered light, in forward scattered light, you see very many details about the rings. The sound that you hear are electrons gyrating around the magnetic field of the planet, and uh, they are exotic sounds. But if you were there, you wouldn't be able to hear them because, because there is no air. But if you had the, the receiver, then you would hear them. Anyway, I just want to point out about this ring and, and this spot. But the other thing that I want to show you is this little dot here. Uh, if we uh, zero in on the dot, uh, here it is. See it? That's our Earth from a billion miles away. So if you were at Saturn and you looked at the Earth, and you think, oh, what's that dot? <laughs> Little do they, would they know. So I, I said I would talk about two moons. One is this uh, Enceladus. It turns out that Enceladus has an ice cover or uh, a nice sheet which is quite thick, except in the South Pole where there are all these jets that are coming out. That was a, uh, and, and uh, it's only 500 kilometers in diameter. This is an actual video that was taken by Cassini. I want to show you uh, how you do this kind of thing. You say, how we decided to go very close and take a look at Enceladus. This is a simulation, but an exact simulation of the maneuvers that you have to do with the spacecraft, because you have to point the instruments in the right direction at the right time. And you can see this is how the surface looks like and the jets that were coming out. And, and of course, there is a finite danger here. This is the altitude. It's only 39 kilometers. Can you imagine targeting something a billion and a half kilometers away to 39 kilometers altitude? I mean, that's only about three times where the airplane flies on Earth. And so uh, we got excellent data in this uh, flyby. We went by the southern hemisphere. These are big crevices. Uh, this is the scale, sort of three by five kilometers. That's where the, the ice jets are coming out. But we were able to also make 
some measurements of the composition of this stuff. And take a look at that. I mean, these are the jets. Methane, water ice, water vapor, simple organics, carbon monoxide, complex organic, carbon dioxide. Where did this organic stuff find its way into a small moon a billion and a half mile, kilometers away from Earth? Nobody knows, of course, and uh, it's a continuing uh, area of investigation. We have flown by Enceladus several times now. We have a lot of data. Unfortunately, the, the resolution of the instrument is not good enough to really tell us what kinds of organics you have. So, so, so much for Enceladus. As I said, we have to go on. Uh, this is an image of the North Pole of Titan. And what you see here is a lake, lake of liquid methane. Uh, the surface temperature of Titan is minus 100 degrees, 108 degrees centigrade. And by the way, here's the size of Lake Superior. And you can see that this is a huge lake. Now, how could you have a lake on the moon that is 180 degrees below zero? Well, because methane, its triple point is minus 182 degrees centigrade. And it plays the role of water on Earth. And you can have vapor methane, you can have solid ice methane, and you can have liquid methane. If we could get a pipeline from here to Earth, then we solve the entire energy problem <laughs> for forever. So, uh, and then uh, Titan uh, Cassini also had a, uh, a probe, a capsule that was built by the European Space Agency and, when, and, and it took images as it fell to the ground. This is one of the images, by the way. This is a lake. What does that tell you? you know? See all these riverbeds that empty into the lake. All liquid methane or ethane. And where the capsule landed, this is uh, what the ground looked like. These, it turned out, one the, could do spectroscopy here, and it turns out that this is actually water ice. But in, in, in the scale here, this is about 20 centimeters. This is right, right, right next to where the capsule landed, and you were looking over and taking images. Okay, so. I want to spend the rest of the planetary exploration part of the talk to tell you a few things about Pluto, since you all remember it perhaps more recently. The, uh, what did we say? We talked about the inner planets, we talked about the outer planets, but there's this strange looking orbit. This is Pluto, and when you plot the mass versus distance from the Sun, Distance, by the way, is measured in astronomical units, and one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So you have the inner planets, and then you have the outer planets. And then you get Pluto. And you look at that distribution, you say, OK, that makes sense. High density and so on, low density. Distance. Who are the Plutos? And here it is. So that was the old view of the solar system. Four terrestrial planets, four giant planets, and one mystery, Pluto. But it turned out that we had the wrong idea, and we didn't uh, understand what was happening in the vicinity of Pluto. In the 90s, there were other objects that were discovered, having these funny names. Uh, and, uh, and, and not only that, but 
draw Kuiper, a Dutch astronomer who was working in this country, found that there are thousands of objects that are many small, smaller than Pluto sometimes, mostly, that are out here. And this is called the so-called Kuiper belt. And the new view of the solar system is that we have the inner planet, we have the outer planet, and then we got this third class of planetary bodies called the dwarf planets. And these are some of these that uh, you can see. And of course, they have all these funny names, you know, run out of names from Greek mythology. And uh, now we have uh, all kinds of uh, names that are coming from the, from the Hollywood world. Maki Maki, Humia, Sedna, Quakar, and so on. So we didn't know all that when we were planning New Horizons. And uh, we, the whole mission started, was launched in 2006, whereby Jupiter to use a gravity assist and, and, and move faster. And we finally got there in July of 2015. And we're now headed to, to another Kuiper belt object called KBO 2014, when we will get there on January 1, 2019. This is the place, by the way, where we built this spacecraft in uh, just south of Columbia, Maryland. Uh, and this is a the final preps for the New Horizons spacecraft. By the way, you see these guys with uh, uniforms and, uh, and face masks and all this. Uh, I suppose, uh, I don't know how many MDs we have in here, but it's at least 100 times cleaner than any operator we have on Earth. And there are good reasons for that, which we don't have time to go into. And that is the spacecraft as assembled. Uh, I thought I would say a couple of things about the launch vehicle. 200 feet, 200 foot tall. It has not only the main part of the rocket with the liquid fuel, but it has solid booster rockets. And all of this to push this little spacecraft into space. It's 575 tons. Spacecraft is only half a ton. In other words, it's, it takes it's a thousand to one type ratio, 0.08 percent, which shows you how expensive it is to really push a small mass into space at these kinds of speeds. So here is the, the Atlas. So Centaur. January. This is Atlas Launch Control at two thousand six nine. Eight, Cape Canaveral, seven, it was a very six, five, very four, nice three, couple of cloudy day. We have ignition and, uh, and you, you can NASA's see the horizon spacecraft on a decade. It, it moved very, very quickly. And then beyond. The spacecraft went by the orbit for the moon nine hours. Now, these are the Saturn booster rockets that I showed you before, and as soon as the fuel to stop, what happens is that the explosive force to really pick them off once they're spent, and then the main rocket will just see them coming off. And they fall into the ocean and it goes out. So then I that's just a simulation of the orbit. I told you that uh, we went by Jupiter to speed it up. And that shaved off about three years in travel time to get to Jupiter. And uh, the arrival date was 7-14-15, exactly 50 years after the flyby of Mariner 4 by Mars in 1965. Uh, 
an overview of the encounter. We started planning a lot of this for many years, but uh, every one of these operations have to be programmed and sent up to the spacecraft. We had to do a hazard search because after we launched the spacecraft, we did intensive studies with the Hubble and found that there were four more moons that anybody knew about around Pluto, and you had to make sure that we didn't bump into one of them. And one had to fine tune the orbit as well, simply because the orbit of Pluto wasn't that well known, and one uses the telescope that's on board the spacecraft to really look at the uh, where Pluto is, and then sort of triangulate, if you like, and then fire the spacecraft on board kick stage or motor to, to really correct the trajectory so we, we got to the right place. We finally did. So this is what happened on July 14 of last year. The idea was that at 11.49.57, at this there was this little rectangle of 60 by 100 kilometers, and, and that was the aim point. Also, the part of the system was to go through the shadow of Pluto and of Charon, its principal moon. That was the plan. There is one problem in these kinds of operations, and that is that, of course, in order to transmit data to the ground, you have to point the antenna. But if you want to make the observations, you, want to, you have to point the instruments there, there, there over there, which means that you cannot be pointing and communicating with the ground. You've got to do the whole operation in the blind and store the data on board the spacecraft and then eventually play it all back. And I wanted to show you uh, uh, what I call a choreography in space. This is an exact uh, simulation of what the spacecraft was doing as it was going by. These are the orbits of the, this is Pluto and Charon and some of the other moons. So the spacecraft was doing all this dancing and pointing throughout. We had no idea, no information, no signal for 19 hours. And then if after 19 hours where the space car was commanded to look back at Earth and say, hey, you know, I got it. If we didn't hear that, then there goes 722 million. <laughs> and uh, that would have been a bad day. Uh, so, needless to say, uh, as you know from the results, and, and, and this is, as I mentioned, is the, it's the exact replication. This is 19 hours in an hour, in a minute and 40 seconds. But it shows you also the, the different, different color lines show the various pieces of the spectrum that the instruments were covering. And after a while, of course, we went past the planet and outbound from Pluto. So I will not show you go into details, just here is what Pluto looks like before New Horizons. Here's what it's really like. And uh, you probably saw this heart-shaped thing, we call this Sputnik Planum, or at least we suggested to the International Astronomical Union that that's what they should call it. Uh, if you want to read details, the 18 March issue of science of this year was on the cover. Uh, this is, uh, these are some of the papers uh, and, uh, with uh, details for each one of these areas with detailed analysis. This is Karen over here and you see this huge crack from one side to the other. This is 1,200 kilometers by the way. And it's I think the longest um, uh, can't find the word right this minute. Uh, such feature that we know about in the solar system. Uh, 
this is part of the geology. There are actually water mountains, or water ice. And uh, a couple of months ago, we got some of the close-up data. We keep playing things back, and we won't send the data back until the mid-October, because from the distance of Pluto, we can only send back data at about 1,000 bits per second, you know, 5 billion kilometers away, 4 billion miles. So you can see these mountains I was just telling you about, which are made of water ice. We know that because of the spectroscopy, which in the end end up in a lake made of solid nitrogen ice. There is a lot of analysis that goes on, and my geologist friends are scratching their heads. Uh, in, in this area, for example, uh, it was possible to see these protruding high altitude areas. We have an, a, a filter on methane, and it turns out that this is methane snow on the mountains in this part of Pluto. Uh, if we had 3D glasses, it turns out that there's a bladed terrain, which again, nobody understands. There are frozen lakes in various places, and we have detailed data on that. And there is a blue sky, believe it or not. Uh, however, it has haze layers. I don't know if you can actually see that there are there is haze in the atmosphere, and there is a very detailed analysis we have that is published again. Uh, this is an image that uh, we were waiting outside the control room, next to the control room, to hear the signal. And uh, you might say, what are we doing here? You, you see uh, nine fingers. The idea was that the ninth planet of the solar system was explored in the 50 years of the program. Uh, as you know, it was front page news. Uh, it, uh, social media went crazy. Uh, we moved the site off campus because uh, it would have crashed in a big way. And it's a good thing we did it. And I just want to show you, uh, you know, we, we also have board of trustees and the staff the Hopkins likes to advertise to our board, and uh, this is uh, this is a little movie for their board of trustees meeting on 11 of November or oh, September. They put together, but it conveys the excitement of what really happened. Uh, we actually built it. It's very short. That's our auditorium at the laboratory, Sanatomi Kosti, many of you know. I have worked so hard and so hard to make it happen. And because she had been a big advocate. If you want to read why Pluto was done, you can read the issue of physics today, uh, this year, this month. Uh, because it was done in spite of NASA, not because of NASA. Uh, and because she was a big part of that. Everybody is a part of history taking place at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Sometimes, if you live long enough, dreams come true. <laughs> and uh, my dream came true, is coming true today as we speak. So, this one we're waiting for the signal to appear. We're counting down. And, uh, when it did Ladies and gentlemen, appear. Pluto has never seen before. P 
PI, mom on Pluto One. This is mom, we have Eastern a Operations Manager, Alice We've Bob. recorded data of the Pluto system. And, and she's announcing that we got the signal back from the spacecraft after all these maneuvering. And then uh, we did the whole mission control team on the Mario. Got the message from the president. I've had the opportunity to observe the team operate this spacecraft. I've had the opportunity to observe anyway, the team. Anyway, that's what to say to, uh, to your trustees when you do something. <laughs> I am just showing you now, coming back to where Voyager is. I told you about the planets. Uh, this is a simulation of the interstellar mission, 38.5 years much more than the four years we promised Mr. Nixon back in 1972. <laughs> and uh, the idea is that, you know, there is a boundary between our solar system and the galaxy. But nobody knew where that was. Nobody knew how long it would take with Voyager at uh, 62,000 kilometers per hour to get there. And it turned out that it was right about here. You might say, well, well, this is Voyager 1. And it crossed on August 25, 2012, at a distance of 18.2 billion kilometers. Right now, it's at 20.2 billion, which is 18.6 light hours from Voyager to Earth. Remember, the sunlight from the sun takes eight and a half minutes. The signal with the speed of light from Voyager to Earth is 18.6 hours. And uh, we all expected that galaxy, the galaxy would be a very quiet place. And that's not what we find. The, I will show you, we have a radio receiver on board. And I think I'll play you here the, uh, the sounds from Voyager, from the galaxy. These are tsunamis that we run into about once every nine months or a year. And there is more. So it has been quite an adventure. And uh, this is now continuing. We don't know when it's going to end. But as I mentioned, Voyager in 2017, August, it's going to be 40 years in space. And the question that we can address now is how far are we really? If you do a logarithmic scale from the sun to the planets, you know, this is one is Earth, uh, 10 is Saturn, 100, 130 where Voyager is. The closest sun with planet is Alpha Centauri. It's in the same scale, it's about 300,000 astronomical units. And if you ask, how far is Voyager? I scale this here. So all, suppose we go to the capital, all inner planets are inside the capital building. The sun is the size of a dime. So this is the capital. The Earth is the size of a brown sugar grain here within the capital city. The Earth's orbit is slightly farther out from the periphery of the capital. Here's where Jupiter is in the scale. Here's where Saturn is in the scale. And here is where Pluto is. Where is Voyager? Well, Voyager is always all the way to the middle of the reflecting pool. 
That's Voyager 1, Voyager 2 is a little slower, and it's right where the white house is. So, in this scale, how far are we on the way to Alpha Centauri? Uh, so, there's a long ways to go and, and to calibrate things properly. Human space travel. Oops, I don't mean to move that fast. We said is to, to the distance to Alpha Centauri is 25.5 billion. It's a mistake. Sterling. I uh, so traveling with, at the speed of light, a round trip would take 8.7 years. Now, needless to say, we have no technology to move that fast. Suppose we could go at the one percent of the speed of light instead of uh, you know. 11 miles per second to 1864 miles per second. Uh, it would take 870 years, 1% of the speed of light. What about our best technology so far? Well, if, uh, if a spaceship could move five times faster than Voyager, then it would take 26,100 years, five times faster than voyage. So, what's the conclusion? <laughs> there is all kinds of nonsense that we all read in the papers about colonization, and how we can get on a cruise ship and go off and go to other worlds. So what's the solution? Solution is clear. I mean, unless we protect Earth, for the, at least the next few hundred thousand years, we're going to be in difficult straits. Colonization is not the answer. And that naturally bring, brings us to, to the issue of uh, humans, human crews. Uh, I want to show you some slides here from uh, things that you're much more familiar with than I am. What are some of the hazards? Well, after gravity, all kinds of physiological changes, balance disorder, visual alteration, cardiovascular deconditioning, distance from Earth, how, what happens if somebody gets sick? Hostile environment, vehicle design, uh, environmental CO2 levels, uh, toxic exposures that have to be and then there is the behavioral issue, uh, aspects of isolation and, and sleep disorder. And one that I have emphasized is acute in-flight effects from and long-term cancer risk. Um, and all of this from space radiation. And because I know a little bit about that, I will take you a, a little farther. I'm sure you have seen some of this data which shows that for the mass of volume that astronauts lose, this is from only about 160 or 200 days in space, depending on the muscle, are, can be pretty large. And some of the astronauts have a hard time walking when they get back. What about the bone mineral density? Well, that drops quite a bit as well. And these are from limited stay in space. But the one that is really even more difficult is the radiation exposure, which is the dose in millisieverts. Uh, and the background radiation uh, is for a year is about one one. Nuclear reactor walkers, the limit is about two. Space shuttle, uh, 10 days, it's about five. 
The Mir station, the or Russian space station, in 90 days was about 70. A thousand day trip to Mars. Remember, it takes about eight months, eight, nine months to get there, brought another year to stay there, another year to come back. Basically, it's a thousand days. Where is one Sibir? See, huge. You might say, well, what does that mean? You know, the Sibir is a kind of a probabilistic unit that says if you are exposed to a seabird, it means that your probability of dying from cancer increases by 5%. Uh, I will get into that a little bit. So but what about the space radiation part? Uh, there are two sources. One is the galactic cosmic rays. And the other is the so-called solar particle events. The sun erupts now and then and puts out all kinds of radiation, protons, that, that are very penetrating. And, and by the way, I'm just showing you data from, uh, and, and this slide in particular, and others are from the uh, National Advisory Council Joint Committee that just from last year, a year ago. Uh, what you see is, uh, what are the levels of radiation uh, and how does it change with time? These are all question marks. They're not necessarily answers. They're question marks. And uh, don't mind the units here. Just note the following. The cosmic rays that we talked about. This is how high an energy they can be. A thousand. What does that thousand MeV mean? So that's cosmic ray. <laughs> when the sun blows, it puts out a million times more particles. And it's not as high in energy. They, they kind of cut off at about 300 units. To bring this home, I put this together. It shows the thickness of aluminum that it takes to stop an electron or a proton for a given energy. Remember, the cosmic rays are a thousand. So for a proton, there's mostly proton. It means that if you have a, a meter thick aluminum wall to stop it, uh, for uh, for solar energetic particles, let's say you need just at 100 MeV, you need about two inches or four millimeters. If you stop them to 300, you probably need about, about uh, four inches, four or five inches. Now, if you can imagine building a spacecraft that has this thick wall, then you would need a nuclear rocket to get it off the ground, and it's going to be very slow. So that is not a solution. So, uh, so how does one list the risk carcinogenesis uh, and the status? This is according to NASA's work. Uh, they developed a model. They have a model that is being refined for research at the uh, National uh, Space Radiation Lab. Uh, they established a health standard. Acute radiation syndrome from solar particle events. And it talks about the, the rate here, because you can get uh, a few sieverts in a few hours, which means you're dead if you get caught out in the open. Uh, degenerative tissue, radiation exposure may result in cardiovascular system as well as cataracts. Cataracts is assured. I mean, you take a trip to Mars and get back, and everybody's going to have cataracts. There's no two ways about that. It's the rest, of course, there are all these central nervous systems, risks, and what the status is is that there is research underway, 
risks are being defined. Animal models are needed to uh, assess clinical significance. So many of you in this, in this audience, these are many, many tasks that you could be working on in the foreseeable future about defining the risk. And uh, specifically for radiation uh, at Mars, they're talking about individual sensitivity biomarkers, whether it's a function of age and or sex, uh, space radiation environmental model, of course, this much we really know, uh, in mission and then post-mission, occupational healthcare for astronauts, personalized cancer screening, biomarkers, a lot of this talks about how you're going to measure things. It doesn't say what the solution is. It's a very uh, key difference. Uh, and of course, the objective is reduction in total risk posture. I mean, this kind of uh, bureaucracy, if you like. You ask a question, you don't know the answer. And you say, well, I'm going to do this, and here's my plan, and so on. Uh, here is one of the slides where they, they classify the total the Mars mission timing, solar maximum, solar minimum, I'm not going to get into that, amount above the 3% standard, and for solar minimum is 4% to 7%, 1 to 3%. Notice this. After the Mars mission solar max, astronauts' lifetime risk of death from cancer is about 20%. And uh, and here are some of the conclusions that they presented, that Mars mission risks have been identified and medical standards are in place to protect crew health and safety. Standards. There is, there is really no clear statement about any solution. The thinking, sometimes I talk to my engineering friends and at one time, one of uh, former NASA administrators, when I said, you know, what are you going to do about the radiation? So, well, he said, by that time, the research community will have discovered the pill that the astronauts can take that will mitigate all kinds of radiation. So how do you like that as a assignment of, of a task? Uh, here uh, is the statement which I find somewhat amazing, there are no crew health risks at this time that can be considered mission stoppers. Because we have defined what the standards ought to be. And then, degree of honesty, sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry about that, Sometimes that happened. Oh no. So, hang on a second. I'll get out of this yet. I was here uh, pointing out that uh, there are no crew efforts. And then, down here, it says the radiation standards would not currently be met. So I don't know if you see any oxymoron here. There are no mission stoppers, but we cannot meet the standards. How about that? Everything is fine. Um, these are the main things that I, I wanted to bring up to your attention. As you can see, we're a long ways away from saying, oh, build the spacecraft, take a crew, they will go to Mars. There is no assurance that we can bring this crew back healthy and maybe not even alive. And uh, that kind of concludes my presentation. I told you about the planet. Thank you very much.
put it in the microphone. Let's see if it's working. Yes. So in all fairness, um, when Richard Nixon canceled the Grand Tour mission of four flights, one of his complaints was, what, you're going to advance the technology that far in those many years? You can't even tell me you have the technology now to do it? And wasn't it true that, that and, and isn't it still true, that you don't plan for today's technology, which is actually sort of how you discussed it at the beginning, you plan for tomorrow's technology and you push that technology and then you get to that point in time to make the, the, the launch. So aren't you sort of ignoring that piece when you talk about person space flight? And I'm teasing a little bit. I, I, it's, a, it's an opening to let you talk about that notion of planning ahead and, and the loss of, of tracking of the, of the uh, Voyager um, the phase locking of the transmitter Voyager and how modern technology <laughs> al at the time allowed us to recapture that signal. Okay, the two parts. Later I'll tell you why I know all that. Yes, thanks. Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, of course, just for the record, uh, Mr. Nixon didn't make any technical arguments. He said it costs too much. You can't do it. Uh, but on the second point, uh, of course, we all plan for uh, technology that we may not have on hand at the time. But you have to have a, a vision of how you're going to get there and a timetable. Uh, in the case of Voyager, you know, the planets were lined up. And if we were not uh, Cape Canaveral in August of 77, you know, another 175 years, we could have done it again. Uh, and many of us didn't want to wait that long. Uh, so, so there is technology and there is technology. There are things that you can foresee that you can hope to develop as long as they do not defy the laws of physics. I mean, there is technology and there is science fiction. And uh, in, in trying to do a mission on a finite timetable, you better have a plan of how you're going to get there. And as you could see from the list, all we did is we have defined what the standards ought to be. We didn't say, and here is a plan that we have that we think by 2029, it will produce the following that we need. And uh, in the case of the radiation issue, you know, uh, nobody will ever be able to really stop cosmic rays. And you can accept the risk of everybody getting cataracts. Well, no big deal. They get back, and they all get operated on, and that's the end of that. But what about if there is a big solar explosion, if you don't have a shelter where the crew can go and stay for a few hours at least until the big part of the radiation shot is over, then they're going to die. So who's going to take the responsibility for that? And who's going to really make the decision that they're expendable? Our society does not condone things like that. It's not going to happen. You know, you've read about Mars One, these people who are going to take a private company from the Netherlands that is going to take people to, to Mars with no guarantee of coming back. And they got 8,000 applicants. They down-selected down to 1,800. And then they, these people didn't know anything about space, by the way. It was just a publicity stunt, and they were amazed when people took them seriously. But a private company, I suppose, can do that if people sign a piece of paper and they say they don't care about coming back. But how do you do that as a, as a government? 
the larger question about uh, how can you foresee technology? Of course, we, we can, not very well. But I'm sure you all saw how this thing, the news about uh, Stephen Hawking and other people who are going to send a thousand chips, spacecraft to Alpha Centauri with 20% of the speed of light. It was in the papers about a month ago. Oh, it's in science this week? You know, and, and, and you look at that and say, oh, you know, that sounds great. You, know, you get a laser together and you just point it to this little tiny thing and it reflects all the light. And of course, that means that it ac gets accelerated by the laser energy. There are a few minor issues like uh, you've got to reflect all the light. If one thousandth of a percent does not get reflected, it will vapor vaporize the tiny spacecraft. There is no technology in the foreseeable future that anybody knows about that would find a material that would have that kind of reflective properties. So all I'm saying is that we have to be very objective and we cannot trust totally theoretical schemes and hand waving about what we can actually do. As uh, remember once I went to a seminar about management in some at Bell Labs, and the lady said, well, I said, oh, you're all here. It says, uh, I can tell you one thing. It says, in God we trust, the rest of you bring data. So, uh, so people have to bring data. Anyone else with uh, a question? Right. So the HSS is supposed to launch uh, in 2017. I, guess, I think it's for scheduled launches 2017. The new you NASA. Mean the James Webb. No, the the new NASA manned rocket. Uh, oh. Yeah, the, the, its first ma unmanned launch. SRS. Be, S, S, SLS. Sorry, the Space Launch System. Right. That. Um, all, that's a huge investment that the U.S. government is undertaking uh, with the goal of sending people to Mars by the 2030s. At least that's how it was pitched at the science, uh, National Science and Engineering Festival earlier this uh, last month. Um, given the fact that there hasn't been any advances in radiation uh, uh, protection, um, what do you see as the future of the SLS program? and man launches? Well, it's going to happen because uh, the SLS uh, as, a, as a rocket project is, uh, has a lot of uses, not only for the human spaceflight program, but also, for example, for the Europa orbiter. We want to take a big spacecraft and land on Europa and drill under the ice and do things like that. There is another one that we're working on called the Interstellar Probe to send a spacecraft that in uh, 20 years will go past Jupiter, past uh, Voyager, because Voyager is going to die in about 2028. So, and you need the SLS for that. So SLS is going to be a general tool. I think um, to advertise it as the rocket that's going to take people to Mars, it's uh, perhaps a little misleading. You know, SpaceX is developing a rocket that will slap together three of their Falcon 9s, I think. And they just signed an agreement with NASA to be helped to land a capsule on Mars. But it is going to be uh, uh, without human, a human crew. This will be, but, but it will be big enough, and they intend to do that. So I think uh, it, it's uh, more 
than just an issue of the rocket. It's what do you do to assure that you can actually take people there and bring them back alive and well. And that's the hard part. And I think we're going to have a long ways before we're able to really assure the, the public and the Congress and everybody else that this can be done. And I'm sure there is nobody at NASA that will tell you that we can do it. So you covered a lot of ground and gave us an integral view, which is not very optimistic. <laughs> so where, where we are going to put our money in the space? Is there an area where it might be giving us gainful information? You mean in an investment investment sense, or uh, yes, yes. well, uh, I I'm not sure about uh, I I don't know a whole lot about the economics of space. I know that uh, that space activities are like probably four or five hundred billion dollars a year in terms of communications, Earth observation programs. Uh, development, uh, landscape uh, analysis, geology, and all kinds of things. Uh, and there are many private companies, but I couldn't tell you where to go and put your money. As for basic research and exploration, I don't think private industry would ever go there. I mean, they, they would not invest money for the sake of, uh, of new knowledge uh, unless they can be assured of a profit. And it's not obvious that there is one yet. Those are traditionally the areas where the government really spends, they puts up the fund, and then when there's the possibility of profit, private industry steps in. And they have, as we have seen in all other areas of uh, Earth observation and, and communication, where that is possible. And I think it's a very good development that we have companies like SpaceX, and what was it, Blue Origin, uh, the Amazon effort that they're moving in the same direction, because there is money to be made. But I don't think you'll see Mr. Branson of Virgin Galactic in, in uh, spending a lot of money to go to Mars. I don't think he would see a big profit. Thank you for that uh, fascinating presentation. I have yes, a two-part question. So the first is the, the slide you showed us, New Horizons, performing all sorts of maneuvers as it approached Pluto. I'm curious how much of that was pre-programmed by your laboratory like before it got there, or was it autonomous? And you've seen technology um, take off like a rocket throughout your career. Uh, do you think our capacity for artificial intelligence will exceed our capacity for human space flight? Uh, the first part of the question on, uh, on how much was pre-programmed, uh, all of it. When you have a round trip lifetime of nine hours, four and a half for the signal to go to Pluto, and another four and a half to get back and get the answer of whether everything works. So, there is no way you could do that in real time. Right. You really have to pre-program it. You have to test it time and again. And, uh, and, and this, in spite of all that, we actually lost the spacecraft on the 4th of July for about two hours for reasons that I don't want to go into. There's no time to do that. Uh, it well, it is to the extent that it's programmed to do so. In the case where we lost it, uh, we have redundancy, and if the computer, the main computer says something wrong, it swaps with the other computer. And it did that, and we diagnosed what happened, and so on. And so forth. But, uh, but all of it has to be done, essentially, in advance, tested, and then you hope for the best that you didn't make a mistake. Uh, the second part goes about artificial intelligence, I, I think you mean by that whether whether the spacecraft could kind of do its own? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, in the, in the spacecraft computers, we had uh, several modes. And if we had not been able to recover the spacecraft <laughs> when uh, 
something happened with the main computer, he had a sequence where he knew how to get the minimal set of data irrespective of whether it had any contact with Earth or not. I don't know if you would call it artificial intelligence, however. It's not that the spacecraft was decided on the spot. It just knew that it had this backup load that if all else failed, it can go to that and do its thing. Uh, to what extent artificial intelligence will actually be able to uh, to be introduced into, into future missions, I think it's inevitable for long-term long missions. You can't just can things and send to the spacecraft and you know, communicate like this. You have to do it. And, and that has been part of the space program all along. Uh, even on, on Voyager, we had some uh, carved wire, mind you, uh, intelligence, uh, you seem to know a lot about, uh, we almost lost Voyager 2 uh, because of a capacitor that opened up on the phase lock loop and and, uh, and we couldn't communicate. But And then we figured out how to do that, not because it was new technology, but because uh, some smart engineer said, oh, you know, if we ramp in the commands and, and go over, then we can catch the window where we can communicate, and, and it has been working for 37 years. Uh, so that is a direction that we're moving, and the technology is moving. Go ahead. I, I, can. I was wondering if you can comment on the Challenger space shuttle disaster, and uh, that was, I, I read about the PowerPoint presentation, which, did mention the risk of uh, the debris, the, how powerful it would, how strong the material was uh, to absorb the impact of the foam. And uh, in the same slide, or maybe in the next You're slide. You're thinking of Colombia, not of China. Oh, sorry, yeah, Colombia, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, um, um, it, it, I think that shows you the limitations of uh, both our knowledge, but mostly of, uh, how should I say it? Not the responsibility, but laxness in, in asking the hard questions and then following them up. And that's the case for both Challenger and Columbia, because people said, oh, well, we've seen stuff come up before and it's okay. I have seen in the robotic exploration cases where if you don't, if you see something once and didn't repeat, and you said, oh, then it must be okay, it's gonna come back and bite you. There's no two ways about that. Right. You really have to chase it down and find the answer and fix it. And that's what not what was done in the case of Columbia. And, uh, and of course, in the case of Challenger, as you know, the people who built the rocket were telling NASA, don't do it, the temperature's too cold, there's gonna be a disaster, and the managers overrode what they said. Yeah, that slide reminded me of that because the, the slide that you highlighted in the end, uh, the top of the slide and the bottom, uh, it was contradictory, so it was similar yes. to that presentation. So, so, so people, people have to call them out on things like that. The managers in particular. The managers are have to check a box, but you can't make reality go away. So let me take my prerogative and ask a question, yeah. and then I think we shall let you <laughs> rest. It's been a long and wonderful session. So the question is. Given the hostile environments for life as we know it on Earth, what is your feeling about the urgency of exploring the solar system for life forms or chemical structures that could lead to life? 
Well, uh, I mean, you can answer the question probably better than I. I mean, we, uh, we need the new knowledge. We have to decide if there is uh, biological activity in the, uh, in the underground reservoirs or Mars. The, uh, it's an existential question. I think humanity has to know if uh, this is the only place where biological activity could ever arise. And, and even our solar system, as, uh, as difficult the conditions are, as they, as they are, we're going to have to explore both Mars in the underground and probably Europa and even places like Enceladus. What are what are all the organics doing in a moon that's only 500 kilometers across? Where do they come from? How could they be present a billion and a half miles from um, kilometers from Earth? I think those are questions that humanity has to answer. Okay, well, listen, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us.